Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on what's going to be in the Combined Chemistry Paper 1 exam for 2023 and this is for the Foundation tier and for people studying the AQA specification. So some things to look out for for Chemistry Paper 1. Evaluate questions as a reminder, you need advantages, disadvantages and your own justified conclusion. Compare questions, need similarities and differences in your answer. And explain questions means why, so include as much scientific detail as possible. And the questions won't remind you to include these things, so these are the things that you need to remember to help structure your answers. So if you need any more details in this, look at the 2023 Biology Paper 1 video where I go over these in more detail. Some other things to look out for, so surface area to volume ratio, that relates to chemistry as well, so could come up. Uncertainty, range divided by two, could come up as well. Averages, mean, median, mode, so not only how to calculate them, but to describe how you would calculate them. Graphs, lots of graphs and lots of tables. And again, I go into more details in this in the Biology Paper 1 video, and I don't want to repeat myself, so do look back there if you missed that video. In Foundation for Chemistry, 20% of it is calculations, so these are some things that could come up. I recommend you brain dump these at the beginning of the exam if you think you are going to forget them. That means when the examiner says you may begin, just turn over your page and write these down in any white space available. So the first one is concentration equals mass divided by volume. That is a calculation you might need to use and they may not give you. So write that one down on a post-it note and brain dump it as soon as you get into the exam. Centimetres cubed to decimetres cubed, you divide by a thousand. So something else to remember, especially if you're heading for those grade fours and fives, because as part of the concentration calculation, you may well need to do a conversion first of all. And if the volume is in centimetres cubed, to get it into decimetres cubed, you need to divide by a thousand, so important to remember. And also, because it can come up in any paper, uncertainty is equal to range divided by two. So brain dump those three things as soon as you get into the exam. The required practicals for combined science are salts, endo and exothermic reactions, and electrolysis. So do take time to learn these properly because they'll be worth 15% of the marks in the exam. So let's start off with this one for salts. You might be asked to make a salt, for example, copper chloride. You need to think to yourself, if you're not given the other information, what acid would you need to make a chloride? and that's hydrochloric acid, and what would you need to add to make copper? So it's often something that's an oxide, so copper oxide in this case. If you're asked to make calcium sulfate, you'd need calcium oxide and sulfuric acid. So look carefully about what you're asked to make, and then you'll know what acid to use. So in this case, we've got a solid, this state symbol means solid, mixing and reacting with our acid. So we'd add into a beaker solid and our acid, but it's important to add this solid in excess. That means keep adding it until no more will react. Because you've got excess in there, you will then need to filter it using a conical flask, a funnel, and don't forget the filter paper in here, and that will collect any of the excess solid that you don't need. So in here, you should have your copper chloride solution in the water. So copper chloride solution, copper chloride dissolved in the water. You then need to heat that up over um, a Bunsen burner with a tripod and gauze in an evaporating dish. But the important thing is you only want some of the water to evaporate. You don't want it to go really dry, otherwise you will not make crystals. So heat it up until some of the water is evaporated and then you will take it off and leave it to cool slowly and then you will get your lovely crystals forming. So that's making salt crystals. 
The next required practical is the endo and exothermic reaction to practical. What I want you to think about is if this is the reaction going on here and you put a thermometer next to it, in an endothermic reaction, it will take in heat from the surroundings. So that will actually mean that the reading on the thermometer will go down. There'll be a temperature decrease in the surroundings because that's what the thermometer is measuring. It's measuring the surroundings. Whereas the exothermic reaction, if your reaction is here and it is giving out heat to the surroundings, your temperature on the thermometer is going to go up because it's measuring the surroundings. And if it's receiving heat from this reaction, it is going to go up. So a couple of key things then. You'll be, be asked to um, perhaps design an experiment for an endothermic reaction. I imagine they'll give you help with the chemicals, but it's often something dissolved in water um, for an endothermic. So you'd put your reactants in there. And the important thing for this practical is improvements. You can improve it if it's using um, a polystyrene cup like this. It's because you don't want to transfer any heat to or from the surroundings. Otherwise, that will affect your experiment. So that's one thing, using a polystyrene cup. Look, if it doesn't have a lid on it, that's going to be improvement. Put a lid on it and surround it by insulation, something like cotton wool. Those two things here are crucial to improving the experiment because we don't want the temperature change to be affected. So you'd measure the temperature before, put the reactants in, measure the temperature after, and you will have a temperature change. If it goes down, it's endothermic, and if the temperature change goes up, it's exothermic. And exactly the same in, thing in here, putting your reactants in, measuring the reaction before, and then surrounding it in insulation and putting a lid on top. The next practical is electrolysis. So I'm going to go through a little bit of theory of electrolysis before I introduce the practical itself. So we're going to start off by thinking about what electrolysis is. It's using electricity, electro, to split something, lysis. And what it splits is an ionic compound. Let's give an example of lead bromide. Now, if you think in life, always think of the positives first. So everything that you see here, the positive bit comes first. So that is going to make a positive ion, lead. And this is going to make a negative ion, bromine. So if we were to melt this, first of all, to make it molten, so we would heat it up and melt this rock of lead bromide, we might want to get the lead out and use it to make some sort of metal component. So if you heat it up and make it molten, in here you will have the lead ions and the bromide ions. And the important thing is, is now the ions are free to flow. I expect that to come up somewhere on the paper. The ions are free to flow. Because if you put the electrodes in here, nothing would happen because the ions can't flow. But now they can. And then opposites attract. The positive ions are attracted to the negative electrode. That will collect around there and make it a lot heavier. And the bromide ions will go to the negative electrode and come off as bromine gas. That's important. The bromide turns into bromine gas. So that's basic electrolysis, and that's when it's molten. There's one example of this, a special example. It's that the electrolysis of aluminium oxide. Aluminium is really important. It's used in things like building aeroplanes. Um, so that's really important. So if we wanted to split up aluminium oxide, we'd first, and this has been quite a common question in the past, dissolve it in something called cryolite. And this lowers the melting point. So in here, we would have, again, positives first. Our aluminium bit is the positive. And don't worry, but it's Al3+. Plus, and the oxide bit is negative. But in this case, these three electrodes in the top are actually all positive. And the negative electrode is actually the casing itself around the outside. So this is a special uh, electrolysis example to, to look at. But the same rules apply. The positives will be attracted to the negative electrode. So you'll get aluminium coming out here. 
and the oxygen will be attracted to the electrodes that are positive and you will get oxygen given off. An extra question that's common, they will sometimes ask, why do these electrodes need to be replaced? Now these electrodes, we'll look at it later, it's made out of graphite. And if you remember, graphite is made out of the element carbon. So if oxygen goes to the electrode, sometimes that will react with the carbon, and carbon and oxygen make carbon dioxide. That is also given off, and therefore these electrodes have to be regularly replaced. So this is where electrolysis gets a bit difficult. In the previous example, we were looking at when we just heated them up and melted them to make them molten. However, if you had a rock, there's another way that you could get that into a liquid. So we've got a substance, our powder or a rock, and rather than heating it, we can dissolve it in water. Hence, I've now called this substance a sodium chloride solution. That means it's dissolved in water, and we've got aqueous there. Now, again, the first bit's positive, so sodium is positive, and the chloride ion is negative. But this is where things get a little bit more difficult, and this is your required practical one. Because you've dissolved it in water, the water actually splits up into H plus and OH minus ions. So if we move to the chamber over here, in this chamber we have sodium ions, we have chloride ions, hydrogen ions, and hydroxide ions. So it's made difficult now because there's two things that are positive and two things that are negative. This is where we look to these very difficult rules at the top. Let's look at this rule first of all. This is the rule for the positive electrode. It says if a halide ion is present, and that is something that's from the halogens in group seven. So if we've got something from group seven, that will go to the electrode. If not, the hydroxide ion will go there and oxygen will be produced. So at the positive electrode, we've got two negative ions. Here they are, the chloride and the hydroxide. So the rule is, if one of these is from group seven, that will go there. If not, the hydroxide ion will go there and produce oxygen. So we look at these two, have a look on the periodic table, and actually we'll find that the chlor chlorine is in group seven. So for this one, the chloride ion goes to the electrode, and chlorine is produced. At the negative electrode, we have two positives. And the rule here for the negative electrode is the least reactive of the positive ions will go to the electrode. Now, that is normally hydrogen, because hydrogen is very low down on the reactivity series, and it says the least reactive one will go to the electrode. The only cases that you need to worry about, really, are copper and silver. If you have something that was copper chloride or silver chloride, then the copper is less reactive than hydrogen, and that will go there instead, and the same for silver. But in this case, the least reactive element, hydrogen, goes to the electrode, and that is, comes off as hydrogen. And left in solution, then, you've got a positive sodium and a negative hydroxide, that will react to form sodium hydroxide. The next example is again a solution. Let's look carefully. It's aqueous, that means it's dissolved in water. So let's split again. The first thing is positive, copper. The second thing is negative, sulfate. And then we've got the water ions in there as well, hydrogen and hydroxide. So we use the rules. So for the positive electrode, if there's a group seven, a halide ion present, that will go to the electrode. So let's have a look. We've got SO42 minus and hydroxide. None of those are in group um, seven. So we say that the hydroxide ion goes there and produces oxygen. And the negative electrode, we look at the ions, we've got copper and hydrogen. And if you remember, I said before that hydrogen is pretty low down in the reactivity series, but copper and silver are actually less reactive. So the copper will go to the electrode and coat it there, turning into copper. We're going to move on to look at math skills to um, surface area volume ratio. That 
is something that could come up again. It could come up in chemistry or physics again. Um, looking at graphs, drawing graphs, tables, reading data from tables. Uncertainty is range divided by two. So that's definitely an equation to remember. Uncertainty is range divided by two. And they could ask you to calculate averages. Now, for the chemistry exam, 20% of it is going to be maths. So it could be things like averages, uncertainty, doing some graphs, graph skills. But it could also be part of the chapter three, which is all about quantitative chemistry. So relative formula mass, concentration calculations, etc. So we'll go through a few of these bits just now. The first one that we'll start off with is calculating relative atomic mass. So this question says, calculate the relative atomic mass of a sample of chlorine consisting of 75% chlorine-35 and 25% chlorine-37. These are just different mass numbers. And it's all to do with this fact here about isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element with a different number of neutrons. So this chlorine-37 has two more neutrons than the chlorine-35. So what we do to calculate the relative atomic mass is we take 75%, which we'll write as 0.75, multiply that by 35, and just add that to 25%, or 0.25, times by 37. And that will give an answer of 35.5. Five. Now, we know that's the right answer because it's going to be an average which lies between 35 and 37. And because there's 75% of 35, it's going to be a lot closer to 35. In the exam, they might give you three or four isotopes, but you do exactly the same thing. If you want to divide afterwards, you can. Because you, if you'd done 75 times 35 and then added that to 25 times 37, you would have had a really big answer like this. And then you'd need to know to divide by 100 to get 35.5. Right, the next one is relative formula mass. Really common. Um, they gave you, um, in the exam last time, a really tricky one last year. Um, but this is the, the basics of it. You have to count how many atoms there are in each compound. So calcium here. There's one of them, and its mass is 40. So 1 times 40. Add that. There's one carbon. So add that to 1 times 12. And add that to 3 times, and let's look at oxygen, 16. So you basically want the mass of the whole formula, hence why it's called formula mass. So if we do that, we would get the answer of 100 and it has no units because it's relative mass. For this one, I just want to put a difficult one on because if you see anything in brackets, that's multiplied by the number outside the bracket. So magnesium, there's just one of those. And I'm just getting the 24 from here. There's just one of those. And all of this in the bracket needs to be multiplied by two. So we need to add that to two lots of 14 for nitrogen and then three lots of 16 for the oxygen and if we do that we will get a total relative formula mass of 148 and you may well see that written as MR relative formula mass now using these numbers we're going to look at another skill called percentage mass I find it easy just to remember that percentage is a little number divided by a big number times 100, certainly when we're looking at science calculations. So this says calculate the percentage by mass of nitrogen in magnesium nitrate. So we want to know the mass of the nitrogen divided by the mass of the whole lot. So we've just worked out the mass of the whole lot as 148. So we just want the nitrogen, and because it's in brackets, we need one nitrogen multiplied by two. So it would be 28 because nitrogen is 14, multiplied by 2 is 28, divided by 148, 
and then times by 100. So we've done the mass of nitrogen divided by the whole thing times 100, and that will give us 18.9%. We do a similar thing by here. This says calculate the percentage by mass of carbon in calcium carbonate. So we want the carbon, and there's just one of those, and that has a mass of 12, divided by the relative formula mass that we've just worked out on the previous slide, which was 100, times 100 will give us 12%. So this for foundation and for higher is the one is the equation that you need to know. Now for foundation, this is the only real equation that you need to remember. So please brain dump that as soon as you get into the exam. Concentration is mass over volume. Now concentration is measured in grams per decimeters cubed. That means the mass must be in grams and the volume must be in decimeters cubed. What they'll do is sometimes trick you out by giving you the mass in kilograms. Okay, in which you need to, because it's kilo, times 10 to the 3, or times by 1,000 to get it into grams. And the volume, they give it to you in centimetres cubed. Get yourself an easy mark. If you see centimetres cubed, divide it by 1,000 to turn it into decimetres cubed. So let's look at this one. It says, what's the concentration of a sodium chloride solution made from 2 grams, that's the mass, of sodium chloride dissolved in there's your banana skin, 200 centimetres cubed of water. They're trying to make you slip up. So that's the volume, but we need to divide that by 1,000 to turn it into decimetres cubed. So we get 0 0.2 decimetres cubed. So that gives us one mark, and we then put our numbers in the equation. So the concentration is what we want. So concentration equals mass 2 divided by volume. 0.2, which gives us an answer of 10 grams per decimeters cubed. So, in the exam, definitely want to remember and definitely worth writing down this tonight um, on a post it note so you remember this one. Now, you may be asked to rearrange it as well. So, if you notice that they're asking you to calculate mass or volume, you're going to have to rearrange it. We're going to look at balancing equations, something that people hate, but just give it a go. At least if you get to this stage, you'll give, you'll give yourself a, a good um, try at getting it. What I recommend you do is do a little wiggle down where the arrow is and show you're working by counting atoms. Zn, there's one of those. Oxygen, there's two of those. On the other side, ZnO, so zinc, one, one, one. So we've just counted how many atoms are on each side. We then need to look at which one we need to um, balance, and at the moment it's the oxygens. So the only place you can put numbers is in front. So let's put a number there, two. That will make now two zincs and two oxygens, like so. We're still not balanced out because the zinc's not balanced out. So two there, and we need a two there. And now that is our balanced equation. Now, for the next one, I've given this to you because often when you have twos and threes, you're going to have to make them up to multiples of sixes. So the same working out, CL, there's two of those, AL, there's one, AL, there's one of those, and CL, there's three. If you write it the right, right way around, it will help you, sorry. CL3, AL1. So this is the one that we need to balance up, the CLs. So if, there's, if we try and make it multiples of six, if we put a three there, to make six and a two there that will make two aluminiums and six chlor chlorides or um, in, in that equation it's a chloride so six of those and then we double check and we still need to balance out the aluminiums so we put a two there and that will give us two overall so do give these a go even if you find them tricky um, just it's trial and error and as long as you've got the same number of atoms either side that's conservation of mass, that no atoms are lost or gained. Okay, so that's why these are important, conservation of mass. Okay, let's move on to a few of the key topics. Let's remember that we're looking at topics one to five for tomorrow. Okay, one to five in your vision guide. So some basics to start off with. You might be asked to complete a table like this. Protons and electrons both have... Both have a relative mass of one, and for the electron, you can write very 
small. Protons are positively charged, plus one. Ele electrons are negatively charged, minus one. You can't just put plus or minus. You have to show that they're directly opposite. Okay, so it has to be plus one, minus one. And a neutron has no charge. On your periodic table, it'll give you a key to which number is which. So this is the relative mass, and this is the proton number. In an atom, there is the same number of protons as electrons. So this also tells you the number of electrons. So if you're asked to work them out, P-E-N, proton says 11, electron says 11, and the neutrons is the mass, take away the protons. So there'll be 12 neutrons. You may be asked to draw it, remembering starting on the inner shell, that can have two electrons. The next shell can have up to eight. And because we've used 10 already, we just need one more in the case of sodium. So that goes on the outside. I know sodium's in group one because it has one electron on its outer shell. Okay, let's look at the development of the model of the atom because we didn't always think it was like what we, um, what we know today. So that was the plum pudding model that we started off with, an early model. It's got a sphere of positive charge with electrons embedded in it. So electrons were the first thing we knew about, okay? And we just thought the whole, the rest of it was a sphere of positive charge. Didn't, we didn't necessarily think it was solid, but we, we knew it was a sphere of positive charge. Then we did the alpha particle scattering experiment, okay? Alpha particles are a helium nucleus. So they are positively charged. So these particles here are positively charged. They got fired at a really thin piece of gold atoms, and this is the main results that they got. Most particles went straight through, like shown, and this showed them that actually most of the atom was empty space. Some particles were deflected, okay, so I haven't shown them on there, but I'll draw them now. They kind of went close to the gold atoms, but because they're positively charged, they were deflected away. So some were deflected like so. And this showed them that the nucleus was positively charged because it was repelling the positively charged alpha particles. And then finally, very, very few were in this scenario here, which I'm just circling, whereby they were deflected straight back. So that showed them that actually the nucleus was very small and concentrated in the middle. So then they came up with a nuclear model, which looks something like that, a positively charged nucleus with the negative charges around the outside, the electrons around the outside. This was further developed by Bohr, who said electrons orbit at specific distances, and that's when he came up with these energy levels. And then Chadwick finally discovered the neutron. So it was the electrons first, then the protons, and then the neutrons. Moving on to the periodic table. Mendeleev came up with a periodic table that you should be able to recognize as the one that's got several gaps in it. Now, he left gaps for undiscovered elements. He did not force all of the elements into certain places. He knew that there must be things that they'd not discovered yet, and even predicted the properties for these. He predicted things like melting points and boiling points. He ordered them by atomic mass, okay, but he moved some of them if the properties fitted better. So mostly they ordered by atomic mass, but if the properties fitted um, better, he might have moved them around a little bit. But there's still um, some um, differences to today's periodic table, because this is the modern periodic table over here, and we actually order it by atomic number. So th that's the bottom number. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and it all goes up in order, okay? If you look at masses, they mostly go up, but in a few situations, like down here, they actually go up and down again. So we do it by atomic number, and we group elements with similar properties together in the same group. Talking about a few things with reactivity then with the periodic table, you need to know about group one and group seven. Have a think about if you know what they are called. Group one, are the alkali metals and group seven are the halogens. The other group that you'll need to name is the group zero, 
which are the noble gases and the transition metals which are in the middle here okay so those are the ones that you're going to need to name let's look at group one you might be asked about re reactivity so lithium here and yes you might be asked to do dot and cross diagrams in your exam lithium has three electrons like so and don't forget it's positively charged positive charges in the middle and it's got three protons in the middle the positive charge again for a larger atom if you if you go down a period sorry don't go down the group okay uh to the next period which is the row so the periods of the rows and the and the columns of the groups each time you go down you add an electron shell so that one has two and you add an electron shell and the next one down has three and so on so each time you go down you add a shell on so this one would be sodium so sodium has two and then eight and then one now this is important for reactivity these atoms like to lose their one electron think about it that it's easier for them to lose one to get a full outer shell underneath than it would be to gain them so they lose one now the trouble is electrons are negatively charged and protons are positively charged so at the moment there's a force of attraction holding those together now if you get a bigger atom like so there's a bigger distance between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electron this is all the information that you need to get down in the exam okay bigger distance between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electron so the force of attraction is actually weaker on a larger atom so weaker force of attraction so what that means in terms of group one is if the atom gets bigger the outer electron is further away and there's a weaker force of attraction and this means that reactivity increases as you go down the group and melting and boiling points actually decrease okay so it's the opposite for melting and boiling points for group seven you need to know about that as well so for group seven think to yourself they've got seven electrons in the outer shell and they need to gain an electron so we've got a positively charged nucleus if we start at this one which would be fluorine because it's got two shells two electrons in the middle and then seven on the outside it needs to gain one perhaps from the sodium to go there now if it's very close because it's negative it's very close to the positively charged nucleus it will be easier to gain it because they will attract so actually the reverse is the opposite for these ones if you have the positively charged nucleus which is trying to attract the electron quite far away then it's going to be more difficult so in this case you want a short distance and you have a stronger force of attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the electron you're trying to gain so actually for group seven the reactivity is highest at the top and it decreases as you go down and remember i said the opposite with the melting and boiling points so they increase as you go down moving on bonding okay this is a big topic expect it to come up um so describe the structure of ionic bonds could be something that they ask and kind of looking at the the higher tier style questions are going to be three four marks for each kind of type of bonding so they'll ask you a few on each normally so describe the structure of ionic compounds you need to recognize them as like this positive and negative charges in a giant lattice and they're made out of ions hence ionic compound think to yourself positives and negatives and the forces that are between positive and negative charges are called electrostatic forces the properties then of ionic compounds is they only conduct electricity when they're liquid this has a link to electrolysis if you remember we said that only when the ions are free to flow can it conduct electricity they have high melting points and high boiling points 
this, if there's one question I want you to take away, this is something that's really common. It will say, describe how sodium and chlorine react to form sodium chloride. And you need to recognize that it's a metal and a non-metal, so it's going to be ionic bonding. So in this case, sodium has one electron in its outer shell that it wants to lose, and chlorine has one space in its outer shell that it needs to gain the electron. So many people lose easy marks here. So bullet point it and make it really clear. Sodium atom loses one electron and becomes a positive ion. The chlorine atom gains one electron and becomes a negative chloride ion. So bullet point it if you need to to get the clarity of the marks. Now, if it wasn't sodium, let's say it was magnesium that has two electrons in its outer shell. In this case, you'd need two chlorines because one electron would go there and it would be full up. So you'd need another chlorine in order for it to react. So in this case, the first example, we just had one Na and one Cl. So that would be the formula. But in this case, we would need one Mg and two Cls. So that would be the formula. So do look out to see how many electrons they've got to give and how many electrons they need. Covalent bonding then. We'll start off with small, simple molecules. So the structure of those ones between non-metals and their sharing at, uh, electrons. They have strong covalent bonds and weak intermolecular forces between the molecules. So if we look at this, we're going to draw this one out, and it's got a strong covalent bond there. We're going to draw O2. You only draw the outer shell electrons, and oxygen is in group 6. So it has six outer, outer shell electrons, and it needs two more. So if it needs two more... That's where we start in the middle. Draw two shared pairs of electrons. We're going to draw one with dots and one with crosses. So it's got six. It needs eight. So it needs two more. So start with two pairs. And then you've used two up there. So the outer shell can only have four more there and four more there. You'll know that you've done it right if you look at each atom and you count Eight in total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's when you know that you've got it correct in total. So this is actually a double bond, O, double bond O, and we show bonds by a single line. Now the intermolecular intermolecular forces, if that was oxygen and that was another oxygen, these forces in between are called intermolecular forces. So the properties, they don't conduct electricity because we're not talking about charges and they have a low melting point and boiling point. The box in yellow is really key for higher tier more than anything else. So if you're foundation, don't worry too much about this box. But it's the idea linking the fact that small molecules have a low boiling point and it's to do with the weak intermolecular forces. So only a small amount of energy is needed to overcome the weak intermolecular forces and it's these forces that are overcome when a substance boils and not the covalent bonds so what it means is it's the forces between the molecules that break up okay these ones here rather than the atoms themselves splitting apart so a bit on um giant covalent then we need to know about three structures see if you can um, remember those in your head We've got diamond here, graphite, and silicon dioxide. They are all giant structures. Talking about structure here. They've all got covalent bonds, which are very strong. And they are, uh, and th that applies to all of them. So those two, and silicon dioxide, strong covalent bonds, and they are giant structures. Now, for diamond in particular, We'll look at a couple of individual property, individual points about the structure, sorry. It's made out of carbon, hence why it's just one type of atom there. And each carbon makes four bonds with other carbons. That's important. Diamonds are forever 
Just made that one up. There you go. Diamonds are forever. They make four bonds with each carbon. The graphite here is also made out of carbon, but this time each carbon atom bonds with three others. So if you've got a carbon here, that bond is bonding with another carbon. We've got another carbon here, another carbon here, and then we'll have one electron. And this electron that's left over, because it's not bonding to a carbon, because you've already got three, is delocalized, and that can move around. And if you've got a moving charge, that means it can conduct electricity. And the silicon dioxide is made, oh, sorry, the graphite, let's add this bit, sorry. The graphite has layers that slide easily, and between the layers, you have weak forces of attraction, which means that they can slide very easily. Silicon dioxide then is made out of silicon and oxygen and is sometimes called sil silica or silicon dioxide. Moving on to the properties, they share very similar properties because they're giant, they have a high melting point and boiling point, unlike the small molecules that have low melting and boiling points. They are very hard. Diamond is very hard. Not all of them, sorry. Diamond is very hard. It's one of the hardest substances on Earth. And graphite, the extra thing you need to know about it is it conducts electricity. So when you talk about properties, think about whether it conducts electricity or not. Think about whether its boiling points are high or low. Okay, fullerenes, something which you probably have avoided revising, but fullerenes may well come up. Um, fullerenes are made out of carbon and they are special structures. So the first one we'll talk about is Buckminster fullerene, which is C60. It's this spherical um, shape here. It's a very, very small particle. And if you're doing separate, it's a nanoparticle. It's made out of hexagons and pentagons tessellated together. And this means it makes a good catalyst because it has a large surface area. Okay in terms of its volume. So really, it would be better to say it has a large, like we've done before in biology, surface area to volume ratio. It's good for drug delivery because it acts like a cage. You can make this around a particular drug and allow it to transport it around your body. And also, it's a good lubricant. So if you had two surfaces that were rubbing together, that would provide a lot of friction. However, imagine this very tiny layer of nanoparticles, so small particles, small fullerenes in between there. And because they're, they're spherical, they can roll around. And if they do that, then they can um, act as a lubricant, okay, to, to reduce the friction. A nanotube, well, a single layer of graphite is called graphene. And if you roll them up into a tube, you can make a nanotube. And they're very strong because of the strong covalent bonds, but they're also very light. And because they've got that extra electron that can go around, they can also conduct electricity. The final structure that we'll look at for this bit is polymers. They're very long molecules made with covalent bonds. So normally they just show you a small section of it in the exam. So this here is just showing if we were to draw a really long molecule, like so, with all the hydrogen bonds on, which I'm not going to draw, this is just showing you a small section of that, because polymers are long chains of um, molecules. So let's look at the structure and properties of an aluminium block. could be any metal, but they're just asking you about metallic bonding here. So with metals... We've got a sea of delocalized electrons and regular arrangement of positive metal ions. So there's loads of electrons that are free to move around the whole structure. And you should know that metals are good conductors. So they have a high melting point. This is the properties, high melting point, high boiling point, and they can conduct electricity. This next question is one to definitely look out for. Talking about pure metals versus alloys. It says, explain why pure metals are soft and alloys are hard. Well, a pure metal has a regular arrangement of atoms in layers. 
and those layers slide easily. This is what you need to say for the marks. It's not difficult. It'll often be a two marker. So the regular arrangement of atoms and the layers slide easily. However, if you have an alloy, it will look a little something like this. And this is different sized atoms because an alloy is a mixture of metals. Or it could be a metal and a non-metal like steel is made out of iron and carbon. So you have different sized atoms that distorts the layers. It doesn't allow them to, to lay regular. And therefore, the atoms don't slide easily. So if you were to hit this one with a ha hammer, the atoms would slide and you could change shape. But if you were to hit this one with a hammer, it would be a lot harder. OK, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I'll put the information on the slide and you can go back to it um, later on. But it could well be a six marker. It comes up in physics and chemistry. It's talking about the structure in solids, liquids, and gases. So fixed positions vibrating for a solid take up a definite shape. In a liquid, as you add more energy, they move close, they're still close together, but they can move over each other. And there's weaker forces until you get to a gas when the particles are very far apart and they're moving randomly in all directions. Now these come with the state symbols. This means aqueous, this means solid, this means liquid, and this one means gas. I want you to look out for this one in the exam. It's the idea of the conservation of mass. Everything on the left, in terms of atoms and mass, must equal everything on the right. So this question looks very difficult. It says 73 grams of hydrochloric acid reacts with 100 grams of calcium carbonate to produce 111 grams of calcium chloride and 44 grams of carbon dioxide. How much water would be produced? But look at the marks. It's only one mark. So we take the information from the question down here. So 73 grams of hydrochloric acid reacts with 100 grams of calcium carbonate to produce 111 grams of calcium chloride and 44 grams of calcium oxide. So that leaves out this. That's what we need to work out. And if everything on the left needs to equal everything on the right, reactants equal products, then everything on the right must equal 173 grams, because that's what the left equals. So if you do 173, take away these two, you should get your answer. Take away 111, take away 44, will give you 18 grams. So just one mark. A simple calculation for foundation that they make look very difficult. In terms of conservation of mass, every the mass before must equal the mass after in a reaction. And that will be true if you've got a closed system. If you have a lid on your beaker, this reading here will stay the same throughout the reaction. However, if you don't have a lid, the reading will go down in this case but only because there's a gas being produced. If there wasn't a gas being produced, then there wouldn't be a change. But the gas can escape, which will mean mass will be lost out of the container. In this case, I've got a piece of metal that's exposed to air on a balance. Any time you see air in the exam, think that the object could react with oxygen. So this time, oxygen could react with the metal and increase the mass look at these equations and see if you could finish these off yourself as word equations. Okay, let's have a look at these um, equations then. So these come up in, in the chapter four. You make a hydroxide, so potassium hydroxide and hydrogen gas is given off. If you just add an acid to sorry, a metal to an acid, again, a simple thing, because we're just adding a metal on its own. Whenever you just add a metal on its own, it's hydrogen that's made. But this time, because it's hydrochloric acid, you make a salt, and it's chloride salt. So you make iron chloride plus hydrogen. The one below, you would make sodium nitrate, but this time, because it's not just a metal, it's sodium oxide, think to yourself, it's not hydrogen anymore, it's water. Okay, so this is a neutralization reaction. The one below, iron hydroxide plus sulfuric acid, 
would make iron sulfate and again because it's iron hydroxide and not just iron it would make water sulfate because it's sulfuric acid so look here hydrochloric acid make chloride nitric acid makes nitrates and sulfuric acid makes sulfates and the final one we've got an acid reacting with not just a metal it's a zinc carbonate a metal carbonate but this is what I want you to look out for carbon if you see the word carbon in there it not only makes the salt and water but you also make carbon dioxide so zinc chloride plus water makes carbon dioxide the final little bit then looking at energy changes so this is where the exo endothermic reactions come in so hand warmers are ex everyday examples of exothermic reactions or self-heating cans you can have food in a can that will um, that heat up by itself if you engage the chemical reaction and this is the reaction profile in an exothermic reaction the reactants have more energy than the products so you can literally write how you know because the products are lower than the reactants on the energy profile you may need to draw the activation energy this is the minimum energy needed for a reaction activation energy the minimum energy needed for a reaction to happen i'll just do a dotted line to make it really accurate it's always from the reactants to the top of the peak like so so that is our activation energy our overall energy change is the difference between the reactants and the products. So this here is our overall energy change. You may sometimes see it as change in heat, okay, delta H, change in heat. And the final thing is a catalyst. You may um, see the effect of a catalyst, which is to lower the activation energy. So a catalyst does two things. Yes, it speeds up a reaction, but it does this by providing an alternative pathway. Providing an alternative pathway, excuse my handwriting, with a lower activation energy. So you show this on your graph with a line with a lower activation energy. So it still goes from reactants to products, but it has a lower activation energy than the first one so endothermic then used in things like sports injury packs because you want the heat from your knee injury to t be taken into the reaction and it's the opposite reaction profile so energy is taken in so the product line is higher than the reactants so combustion is an example of a chemical reaction that is exothermic and Thermal decomposition, where you take in heat to break down something, is an example of an endothermic reaction. 